Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to this very special place and this very special vlog. But let me start at the beginning with an introduction. This is vlog 120 titled The Organic Intellectual and I'm in a very special place. I'm in Sackville Park in the middle of Manchester. It is five o'clock in the morning and I have a very very special companion with me through this journey. Now I am in the middle of Manchester, literally in central Manchester. Uh, the clubs are just emptying so some interesting things may occur. You may see some interesting people for which I apologize in advance but let's enjoy ourselves through this incredibly special moment for me and I'm very moved, very emotional, got a bit teary actually when I walked into Sackville Park and saw the statue. My entire life I've waited to sit here and I'm doing it this morning. So look, some weird things are going to happen but this is Manchester and to quote the late Tony Wilson, we do things differently here and indeed we do and particularly I wanted to sit in this very special location. The man sitting next to me, or more accurately the statue of the man sitting next to me is Alan Turing. Alan Turing was, is, the father of contemporary computer science. He committed suicide in 1954 after being committed to the crime of gross indecency, that is, homosexual acts. When convicted in 1952, he selected the punishment of chemical castration rather than going into prison. And he killed himself two years later, 16 days before his 42nd birthday. He uh, poisoned himself with cyanide in an apple. And of course he's holding an apple today. So the positioning of this memorial is incredibly important. It is a difficult place to film, but I don't care. We were always going to do this vlog here because this bench is situated between the science buildings at Manchester University and Canal Street, which is the home of the gay community. And this statue is in between science and the gay village, very powerful. So there are many reasons Alan is known around the world, the way he is famous, like only very few scholars can be famous. But he's also known for his service during the Second World War at Bletchley Park, the code breaking centre where his profound mathematical expertise increased the speed with which German code could be broken. In 1999, uh, Time magazine listed Turing as one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century. And they stated that, quote, the fact remains that everyone who ever types at a keyboard, opens a spreadsheet or a word processing program is working on an incarnation of the Turing machine. 2008 the BBC made a fantastic documentary featuring four mathematicians and they titled that documentary Dangerous Knowledge. Dangerous Knowledge, how powerful is that? And that will provide I think a real trope and a motif for what we're going to talk about today. But also in 2012, the centenary of his birth, Manchester City Council launched an Alan Turing Award that recognised individuals and groups that are fighting homophobia in Manchester. So here he sits, and here I sit, how exciting is this? Here he sits between the science buildings of a university and the gay community. And by the way, his birthday is in a couple of days. And if we'd returned in a couple of days, it's great in the park, actually. People put a party hat on Alan and balloons and flowers, and it's really an exciting birthday party for him. But on this early morning, it's pretty well Alan and me. There's a very interesting cluster of drag queens there about 100 yards away from me that are listening. So it'll be very interesting to see what they do. But really, at this early stage of the morning, it is Alan and me. And together we're going to explore for you, yes you, the organic intellectual. And there really is probably no more poignant place to do it. I'm actually only holding my voice together, it's such an emotional thing for me. So this concept, the organic intellectual, has really been the guiding principle of my entire academic life. And in this special place, I thought I would share it with you. When I came up with vlog one, I was always going to do a vlog on the organic intellectual. It took me 120 to get here, but we're doing it in Sackville Park and it was worth the wait. So what is the organic intellectual? Well, the organic intellectual, that phrase, 
comes from the scholar, the activist Antonio Gramsci and his prison notebooks. Antonio Gramsci was imprisoned for his beliefs by the Benito Mussolini regime. So the organic intellectual at its most basic disconnects and disagrees with the notion of the disinterested, dispassionate scholar. It critiques the notion of the traditional academic, the traditional scholar, the traditional intellectual as a person who holds universal reason and a commitment to universal truths. Gramsci argued that such a traditional intellectual maintains the status quo and actually reinforces already existing power structures and social inequalities. So he argued that the unspoken assumption of what we're doing in academic life is to reinforce already existing power structures. Wow. So no one's suggesting that you have woken up when you're an undergraduate or you wake up as a PhD student and say, right, what can I do today to reinforce the patriarchy? What can I do today to reinforce capitalism? That's not the point. But the argument that they're making about the traditional intellectual, I think, is pivotal. That it's ma maintaining homogeneity, consensus, rationality, and acceptable thought. So to be part of a university, to be a legitimate intellectual, we have to fulfill that role. We have to fulfill that narrative. And if you think about it, you are doing a PhD. You are configuring an original contribution to knowledge. But what's that based on? Let's be frank. It's based on understanding traditional knowledge, the knowledge that's already in existence, and then using tried and tested and accountable methods to just stretch knowledge a tiny little bit. But what if the literature is wrong? What if the questions you are asking, the research questions you are asking, are wrong? What if you're simply providing the knowledge that the society requires at a particular time, that the funders, the grant agencies need you to write? So if you think about it, what we do in education, so much of what teaching and learning is about is repetitive, it's cumulative and it feeds into common sense. But the organic intellectual is different. This is an unstable identity. This is a contingent identity. It's not in a comfortable space. In fact, it claws out new spaces, innovative spaces, that people didn't even think knowledge could come from. So perhaps you can understand a little bit about why we're here today with Alan between Manchester University and Canal Street. Because Alan is an inspiration, the best of what we can be as a scholar. And I hope he is an inspiration to you, but also the organic intellectual. On a bad day, remember my words today. Gramsci argued that so much of education, so much of learning involves repetition, accumulation, simply reinforcing that which we already know. And that means the truths of our time, common sense if you will, transcends far beyond its usefulness or its reasonableness or its effectiveness. Teaching generation after generation after generation of commonsensical knowledge is having an impact. So for Gramsci, education had to be a lot more. It is disruptive and it challenges the status quo. So differences, uncomfortable, unstable, defiant differences are important to how we think about this different and defiant knowledge. So differences via class, race, gender, sexuality, age, just to use the sociological mantra this morning, won't sit naturally or comfortably in the scholar's toolbox. So identity, who you are, starts to chafe starts to rub. So the organic intellectual uses who they are to start to challenge common sense, challenge what we take for granted. So the role of the organic intellectual is not to hook into or insert this newly legitimized knowledge back into common sense. It's not about learning new stuff over here and hooking it back in. That's not the point. 
what the point of the organic intellectual is, is to show that all the knowledges that we've grown up with, that we've accepted as true, are not. They need to be challenged. So class-based inequality needs to be revealed, needs to be seen rather than assumed. So why black men are in jail in numbers far beyond white men need to be questioned, challenged and critiqued. This is not business as usual. So the organic intellectual is a maker, a maker of knowledge and a communicator of knowledge, intervening in practice and intervening in theory. So the organic intellectual reveals, if you will, the provisional nature of truth, the provisional nature of the knowledge that we hold to be true. Now I find all of this incredibly inspiring, particularly now. Although we're living it, we have to recognise we live and we're researching, we're working in profoundly odd, unusual, unusual, weird times. Think about it. Climate change, pollution, water security, food security, energy security, unemployment, underemployment, deep poverty, the casualised economy, before we even get into Trump <laughs> or Brexit. Now Steve and I watched the Trump election with a fair amount of horror. And look, we could have assumed the traditional role as intellectuals and looked at, you know, how did Trump happen, look at celebrity culture, look at the patterns, the voting patterns of rural voters, start to think about why the disempowered white working class had disconnected from more progressive political forces. All of that is interesting, but all of that is functioned and created by a traditional intellectual project. So when Steve and I decided to write the book Trump Studies, we made the active decision to use an organic intellectual trope. We were moving far beyond what was acceptable traditional academic intellectual rules. We did not accept this state of affairs as normal, as natural or business as usual. This is not business as usual. This man is not simply another President of the United States, just as Brexit is not simply another moment in the complicated, convoluted history between the United Kingdom and the United Europe. So the organic intellectual problematizes common sense and realizes for not one minute should Trump be understood as a natural or normal or legitimate president. This is not presidency and business as usual. Racism and sexism should never be naturalized. We should never accept comments about Mexicans, men and women with impairments, women, smart people. If we sit and accept this knowledge as common sense, then we as scholars are complicit in the disempowerment of others. So the organic intellectual crafts out a separate space, a different space, a defiant space to show that alternatives are available to common sense. So the reason why, for example, some of the most empowering methodologies on planet Earth right now are coming from Indigenous scholars is because higher education institutions are colonising institutions. So Indigenous scholars do not sit comfortably in these institutions. They're not part of business as usual. So universities are colonising institutions and Indigenous colleagues have to sit and be staunch and fight and occupy a different type of scholarly space. So they are organic intellectuals because they have been excluded from the commonsensical pro product and produce of creating knowledge. So the Gramscian definition of the organic intellectual was someone who came from a social class or indeed a social group that never made it through school and never made it through university. So this is a person who came from an unusual social background and yet carried that social background with them through their formal education. So you can see why we're sitting next to Alan with Manchester University on one side and Canal Street on the other. Because 
because of his times and because of the laws of those times in which he lived, his gayness was illegal, illegal. And he was chemically castrated because of it. So all his traditional intellectual commitments, his brilliance, his courage in fighting the Nazis, all of that was irrelevant because he was gay. So the organic intellectual allows all of us to understand who we are and use who we are to create a better knowledge. It allows us to be remarkable, be spectacular and stand for something, stand for difference. None of this is about denying who we are. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's actively using who we are, our truths, our injustices, our prejudices, our discriminations, to make better knowledge, a tough knowledge, a rigorous knowledge, and yes, a more inclusive knowledge. So I think Alan Turing would be proud of us. There is a famous story that when he was arrested and charged with gross indecency, he explained in the police station exactly what he did. <laughs> he didn't deny it because he said he has nothing to be ashamed of. So he went in some detail about what he actually did. No shame, just his truth. So at a time when being himself was illegal, Turing had the courage to be an organic intellectual and speak his truth and his identity to police and in a court of law where he pleaded guilty to gross indecency. So this example I think is really important. It means for those of you out there in a PhD program trying to offer an original contribution to knowledge. You have to remember an example like this and about the importance of a commitment to and a commitment for change. So from the truly beautiful Manchester with Manchester University on one side, the gay community on the other and I hope the drag queens really did enjoy this experience. It's been a really weird recording experience for me but it's, it's been amazing. I've waited my whole life to be here and it was worth every minute of it. So from the Alan Turing Memorial in Manchester I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.